There we go. Okay, so it seems we are live. Perfect. So, um, hello everyone. Welcome to this uh, Facebook Live. I'm uh, happy to welcome you at the first voiceover Facebook Live organized by Mandy on, uh, on setting and focus on setting up a home studio with notable voices uh, with Nick here. Hi guys. Uh, my name is Petra and I am here on behalf of Mandy. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I would like to welcome here our voiceover guru. <laughs> uh, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about uh, Nick and also uh, notable voices. So, you know, uh, who is, uh, you know, giving all these advices. So uh, Nick is the founder of Notable Voices. Uh, that's uh, London's uh, highest rated voice reel and voiceover studio. Uh, after working in audio for 15 years, uh, first as a touring session musician, then as a qualified audio production lecturer, Nick was then introduced to directing voiceovers and has not looked back since then. And today you will find notable voices in a Squanke studio in West London, working with some of the uh, London best voiceovers agencies, household names, drama graduates and, and to uh, total acting novices to create long-standing and fulfilling careers in the voiceover industry. There you go, listen to that. <laughs> uh, I'm tell I wrote that myself. <laughs> Is there anything that you would like to add about, you know, maybe when, when you set up the studio and, uh, you know, how long has been going and how can people reach you? Of course, yeah. So, like you said, uh, my name is Nick. Um, I'm the founder of Notable Voices. And I think the main thing that I want to say is, you know, I've been in the same point that you are all in right now, setting your home studio up for the first time. And I know it's daunting. So I want to kind of be as helpful as I can. Uh, my first studio booth was in the cupboard under my stairs, covered with carpet. Um, so I've done it all. I've tried it all. And hopefully I can stop you guys making the same mistakes I've done. Um, like I said, I work in West London. I have a, a recording studio now um, and I provide coaching for voiceover. I do demo production um, as well as mentoring as well. So if any of you at any point want to get in touch and have a chat, you can at hello at notablevoices.co.uk. Um, I'd love to catch up with all of you. Uh, lovely. Can you also tell us, uh, you know, how has it been for you like since lockdown? Like how uh, were you busy or, you know, if you can a little say. Absolutely. Uh, look, yeah, it has been a weird, weird year, but not in the way you would imagine. It's probably, been, you know, I've been doing audio and voiceovers for close to a decade now, and this has probably been the busiest 16 months of, of my professional career, um, which is very exciting, of course, because there's been such a growth in audio content. Audio has never been so popular. Radio plays are back. Audio books are huge. Online e-learning is huge and all of these different mediums have become so popular that the voiceover industry has never been busier. Um, so it's been it's been great. And I think that's kind of inspired a lot of people to get into it as well. But it's also created um, awareness of VO. I think uh, for a long time I spent my time create, almost creating awareness because people didn't realize that it was something you could do for a living. Mm. And that annoyed me because it's actually something that it, you can do flexibly you can do it from home um and people just didn't realize about it so it's nice to know that voiceover is becoming a more common part of the creative kind of workforce uh and do you think it's it's going to so obviously now uh, you know all, most of the studios are uh shut or you know they don't uh, so there's a lot of voiceovers that are now investing uh, money on home studios. Do you think this is go it's going to stay like this even, uh, you know, when this pandemic is over or what, what, what's your Absolutely. Take? Yeah. Um, I've, I was speaking to a client about this this morning who's just bought her home equipment and bought it to my studio for me to set up for her. And yes, we are very much um, been pushed forward five years in the industry we've been forced to kind of go remote and it's been such a success globally that we will not be going back so investing in home studios is not it's you've not missed it 
it's just going to continue to grow. I know for a fact that all the big London agents are kind of wanting all of their clients to have home studios now. And I've set, set up so many people's home studios over the last year with the agents. Um, so it's going to continue to grow. And also it's just so much more affordable for everyone and you can get things done on a quicker turnaround. It's just a much more streamlined way of doing things. Um, so I think, yeah, we are in it for the long haul now. So get your home studios ready. <laughs> uh, okay, so on that note, uh, I just want to say that we're going to go through a lot of different, uh, very technical stuff, but also mm -hmm. for uh, beginners. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure there is a lot of voiceovers or actors that are thinking about being voiceovers. So we're going to talk about like uh, starting and set it back, uh, setting up a home studio, but also we're going to go maybe a little bit more in depth uh, for some people who are already having their booth and uh, you know they have some specific questions so mm -hmm. we have we ask uh, our members to to send us uh, questions uh, there's been a lot of questions and uh, so i kind of categorize them because there is also a lot of repetition people mm -hmm. kind of want to know the same things but also i would uh, encourage uh, anyone who is watching at the moment just put your questions in the you know in the chat box or you know just uh, uh, put your comments and questions and we will go through these after when uh, when i when i read all the questions that i i prepared or the monday member sent in brilliant and for anyone listening if i speak too fast which i always do please just write in the comments for me to slow down and I will repeat myself. I've had a lot of coffee today, so I'm pumped. I'm ready to go. All right. I think it's, it's a good time to just get your uh, notepads, uh, pens, or if you're, uh, you know, making notes. Uh, so get ready with all this uh, useful information that we're going to hear from Nick. Uh, so we're going to start with obviously kind of like basic stuff uh, yeah. for uh, starting up. So, uh, could you please tell us just a, a basic step-by-step -step when you're setting up a home studio from like a very kind of easy or a very simple studio into maybe something more sophisticated? Okay, of course, yes. You, um, you can kind of set up a, a studio on any budget, which is the first thing that I would make sure that people are aware of. Um, there's this stigma that you need to spend loads of money, but that just isn't true. Um, the most important thing that you all should be thinking about is not the gear, but the room. The room is key. Um, you know, you can have this lovely Neumann U87 in your living room and it will sound terrible. So don't think investing in good gear is going to create good audio. What you need to think about is controlling room sound. So you need to be thinking about getting a small space in the house, maybe a room within a room and covering it with blankets, pillows, duvets, just anything to stop reflections because reflections are the enemy of the voiceover artist. Um, what I mean by reflections, if, if you're standing in a living room and you clap, that sound will bounce off walls and then bounce back into the microphone. If we cover those surfaces, those hard surfaces with things that are soft, the sound absorbs before it goes back into the microphone. So get that right first and happy days. Once you've got your room sorted, you, you can then go two avenues. You can go the cheap way, which is to get a, a USB mic, which lots of people do at the start. And all that means is you need a USB mic, something like the Blue Yeti um, or the Rode NT-USB. And you plug that straight into your laptop. And then all you'll need is a pop filter, which is this. Mm -hmm. And you'll need a mic stand. And then you're good to go. That will cost you around 120 quid, maybe a little bit less. Um, if you wanted to step the game up a little bit, you would go with the audio interface setup. So you'll get your room perfect. That's always the first thing. Then you would look at getting an audio interface. They come, they start at about 90 pounds. And what they are doing is... And if someone doesn't know what is audio interface, can you explain that as well? Yeah, so basically when we use microphones, they need to be powered. Um, so this here is a condenser microphone um, and it needs to be charged with um, extra extra energy. And then it also needs to be the, the, the digital audio needs to be translated into readable audio format. So an audio interface, one, gives the gain and gives the, the, the juice that the mic needs to work. 
and then two turns it into readable audio so when we buy non-usb microphones we must have a separate audio interface to connect in and once you've got that you'll then need to get a microphone which would i would suggest starting with something like the rode nt1 r-o-d-e nt1 um, and then you'll need an xlr cable which will plug the mic into the interface you'll need a mic stand and a pop shield um, and then that would be your setup and then that would run you around 350 pounds mm -hmm. and in my opinion that's the one i would go for um, because USB microphones, if we're wanting to set ourselves up as a professional, USB microphones just don't quite have the same frequency range as a cardio or condenser mic. Um, so it's important to make these investments in yourself and in your business if it's something that you really are serious about. Okay, uh, but also uh, I think what is important, I think a lot of the voiceovers are just... Uh, really eager about how if they you know if they auditioning for uh, different uh, jobs mm -hmm. if, uh, if they you know if they make a read uh, if just the, the audio sounds as good as uh, you know as the client is going to be happy mm. yeah I mean at the end of the day it's all just about clean audio um, so if you can get that then that would be great and like I said the main thing is the room uh, when I, because I cast roles all the time, and if I get an audition where it's in a big echoey room, even if the read was great, I'm not really very interested because I can't really get an idea of how it is. So if you are working on a budget and then you can just get the USB mic, that is completely fine. Just make sure your room is sorted, and then your auditions will go really jump up a level. Okay, and uh, so if you're setting up a home studio, can you? Can you just use, uh, it's kind of the DIY question. Can you just use uh, things that you already have in home? To set up your home studio? Yeah. Absolutely. Like I said, my first one was just uh, walls and floors covered in carpet. Um, obviously, professional soundproofing is better, but it's expensive. Um, and we're not all there at, that, at the beginning of our careers to invest in that what you need to be using is soft furnishings. Like I said earlier, so pillows, blankets, duvets, quilts, jump, clothes are a great natural sound dampener. Um, that would work absolutely fantastically as long as you can put it in the right places. Um, and then the other thing that you've got to consider is outside noise, outside noise coming in. So kind of ambient and transient noise rather than just reflections. So obviously don't put your booth... Um, next to a busy road if your living room is facing the road go to the back room because those noises will make a difference too but absolutely absolutely you can use home stuff um, I did for ages and it worked just fine and then when I was able to reinvest with the money that I had made I then got the next step up um, but you know a good duvet for goes a long way you know revert back to your childhood get in the duvet it works Okay, so if you say that, like the, what is the budget for the really the simple, simplest uh, home studio? Simplest home studio, and there's a very, very basic level, I reckon you could do it for 120 quid at the basic level, at the base, base, base level. Um, it's not going to be a great studio, but you're going to be able to record auditions and send them off. Mm -hmm. And probably it's also good for training, you know, if, if you are just yeah. starting. Training, practicing scripts, sending off auditions, that would work just fine. Um, I wouldn't go any less because the microphone will almost not be worth the time at that point. If you're spending less than like 50 quid in the mic, it starts to become almost as good. Your, your, your phone mic is almost as good at that point. Mm -hmm. And when you get to a kind of more professional stage and, uh, you know, you want to really step up your game, what would you say is the budget afterwards? I think once you're, you know, you're landing some roles and, and you're feeling like you want to take this forward, I think that £500 is a, is a really good budget because you want to be able to get a good mic, which is going to cost you between £150 to £250. Um, like I said, the Rode NT1 is the base grade professional mic. And then after that, I would recommend the Sennheiser mk4 which is about 250 pounds mm -hmm. that's a really really lovely professional mic that you've seen in a lot of studios and then a good audio interface like the scarlet solo 
which is by a company called focus right um and then if you're doing all of that work then i would suggest to invest in some sound treatment then something like universal acoustics do really really nice sound dampening and you're just looking to catch those main points um but yeah you i reckon you could do that for under 500. okay uh also, can you run an, an effective home studio if you are not particularly tech savvy? You know, you're not really friend with uh, with PC. Uh, you yeah. know, it, <laughs> you find it all hard. Uh, you know, all these different softwares. Uh, sure. What do you think? I have a lot of clients who are not tech savvy. Um, lots of clients, and I have audiobook narrators who you know uh, are, are trying to learn audio as well. You do need some understanding um yes because it's a technical thing you know you've got to know how to record but it's not as scary as you think it is um people always get scared when they think of audio and recording it and noise and stuff but um you learn the basics which is pretty simple and you'll be fine but you do need some understanding because otherwise you'll get yourself flustered um and you'll end up not wanting to do it anymore and you don't want to do that so don't take on an audio book before you're ready for example because it will end up getting a lot more complicated than it needs to be um learn the basics of editing and recording first because you're not going to be expected to do a lot but if you're doing a session you are going to be expected to press record cut the mistakes out and send it off in the format that they require if you can do that then you're on the right track okay um so also another question is how can you really tell when your home studio is good enough for professional work like how do you recognize it from from your recordings absolutely uh, that's a good question um there are certain parameters that i look for in audio to to let you know if it's if it's if it's good enough i think the first thing is the room can you hear an echo just very basic um if it if it's not got any echo on it, you're at a great point. The next thing we need to discuss is your noise floor. So when we when we record, rooms have natural noise. So my room right now has a tone to it. And we say in voiceover that we're looking for a minimum of a minus 60 decibel noise floor. Um, so what you need to do to figure that out is you need to um, run a, a simple diagnostics check in whatever door that you use, which is a digital audio workstation, and it will tell you how loud your noise at the bottom of your audio is. If that is really fuzzy and you're getting lots of feedback, that's not going to be passable quality. Mm -hmm. But if it's quite quiet, then it can work. And then obviously the reflections, like I said, and that you're recording at a nice volume. I usually say that you're peak volume when you're recording should be coming in at around minus nine decibels and if you're doing all of those things and it sounds nice and clean not echoey and your noise floor is not too loud you should be pretty good to go mm -hmm. and uh is it uh, is it something that you do that you would give like uh, you would uh, um, listen to someone's recording and just tell them oh, this is good enough or you have a you know just to give them feedback about their recording? yeah yeah absolutely I do that all the time I you know my inbox is just full of people being like Nick can you ever listen to this um, so yes absolutely it takes it doesn't take long so of course if anyone is unsure and wants some help please email me at any time. Um, I'm more than happy to check it out for you. I might not be able to get back to you right away, or it might be quite a, a quick answer, but I will always answer um, because, you know, I want to help as much as I can. But look for those things, send it over to me. I can have a listen to it for you, and then I can let you know what you need to do to progress it. But it's usually always the room. Can't put enough stress on that. The room is yeah. the biggest thing. Yeah, and, and the next question is also about it because someone asked if uh, uh, what is more important to have a high quality mic or a very quiet room. And I think you said it already several times that the quiet room is the most. Yeah, important. well, like, if, for example, like I said, this mic's a beautiful mic, um, cost me far too much money. Um, but if I was to take this home to do a voiceover, it would sound dread. It would sound worse than a bad mic because it's such a sensitive mic that if it's not in a professional environment, it's going to pick up the neighbors half a mile down the road, the birds, the, the lawnmowers, the aeroplanes. So I, 
it, there's no point getting a great mic if you're not in a good space because it's just going to make everything that much harder. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so uh, another question is, how would you build a physical studio in an open living room space around a desk? Mm. Is that That's a good idea? Or? You know, they, 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 that, that can absolutely work. I've helped many people do that. The best thing to do is to think about a room within a room. That's the best way to think about it. So you've got a living room, which is obviously too big. The ceilings are high and it's not going to work. So all you need to do is create yourself a cocoon um, like you're a like you're a caterpillar, I guess. Um, so best way to do that is something as simple as PVC pipes. Create yourself a bracket around you, throw a bunch of acoustic blankets on top, covering yourself and you've got yourself a little booth um and you know make sure you cover your the top of yourself you cover the sides um you can probably hang the acoustic blankets on the pvc piping and the job's good and it works really well i know loads of people who do that um the main thing is that you just make the room smaller it's easier to deal with sound when it's in a smaller space okay uh another question is what is the best practice for utilizing a space you only have for a few months at a time so it's a kind of a question for mobile home studio so if you are you know traveling quite a lot and mm -hmm. spend time in hotels yeah i actually have a lot of clients who 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 are in hotels all the time who do voiceover and um i i, I was explaining to, to you earlier that i have a client who records in her car she's you know traveling around africa at the minute and then recording in her car when she gets a job and then going back on her adventure um for, you know portable studios are completely normal a lot of people in hotels you know they just get all the pillows from the hotel sofas and they make themselves a little hidey hole and then they sit in it and they do their voiceovers in there so it's completely doable. I mean, again, it's just about creating a little space. Even if you just have room to put your head in a box, get the mic in there, put cushions all around you, put a duvet over your head, stick your head in. That would work. It won't sound incredible, but it would definitely work. And like I said, or just get in your car, shut your doors, fill your car with blankets and pillows and duvets, and then you've got yourself a little booth and it works really well. I know people have recorded national campaigns like that. Um, you know, be creative. Just think the, the key is dead sound. As long as the sound is dead, it will work. Um, and you can do that with any portable setup, you know, just find the stuff in your living room, be, be creative. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, setting up a home studio in your car is, is easier than in your living room. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cars are great because they've naturally been built to have some soundproofing, so we don't hear the motorway. So they've already got so much of the stuff done in the windows are pretty thick. Um, obviously it reflects really badly. So if you can cover the room, the space in your car up enough, it, I know a lot of people who record a lot of voiceovers in their cars. Um, it's, it's, it's not as weird as it sounds. Um, same with hotel rooms. People do it all the time. I have clients who are on cruise ships and then they turn their cruise ship cabin into a booth. Um, you know, you can do it anywhere. You really can. Um, so this is a, a bit similar, but a uh, question. What equipment would you recommend to use as a portable steer that can be used only with just a cell phone? With just a cell phone? Ooh. Would you recommend this or just like leave the cell phone? Uh, you know, don't, it, don't use the cell phone. You, I, I don't know why you would do just a cell phone because a little USB mic is so small. And a lap, and we all have laptops with us now. Um, I would try and steer away from that idea. Um, if you are going to do it, you can get little Rode lapel mics that plug into the bottom of your cell phone that you can put, do on the Voice Memo app. You can try that. Um, they're not very expensive, but for not much more money, you can get a USB mic and you can have your laptop, and that's going to create a much better sound. Um, so I would steer towards doing that instead i think okay uh also i noticed there was quite a lot of questions about people want to convert a shed into a, a voice booth so mm -hmm. uh what is the best way to soundproof an outdoor shed in order to convert it to a sound studio cool i've just literally just helped someone do this actually okay uh, so yeah very topical i think the first thing to do is um figure out how noisy your surroundings are because transient noise is a pain 
Um, we have two types of noise problems, transient and ambient. Transient uh, noises that come in and out. So um, a chainsaw going on and off would be a transient noise. And an ambient noise is like the gentle hum of a humidifier or an air conditioner. Um, so we need to make sure we're battling both of those. With an outdoor shed, um, what I would tend to do is you would have the outside of the shed and then I would create a small air gap and then I would build an interior wall. And then I would also, and in that air gap, you can put rock wall in there. It's quite useful. So shed, rock wall and air gap, <clears throat> and then an interior wall. And then I would put paneling or sound treatment on the interior wall. So then you have shed, rock wall and air gap, plywood wall, acoustic foam, and then carpet it foam on the ceiling that tends to do well um, the only problem with shed studios is it's hard to or expensive to put windows in so a lot of people struggle with the idea of it being a windowless cave um, but you know the, um, if you have the money to invest in double glazing like sound proofed windows then do it but otherwise windows are the enemy because you need a pretty good window to stop sound coming through um, and then the other thing is door is really key. Make sure you, you, you put in a door that has a seal on it. So not a shed door, for example, just isn't good enough. You would need to replace it with a better door. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and there is uh, uh, another question. If other voice booths you can buy truly soundproof or would an audiometric booth work as a soundproof recording booth? Say that again, sorry. Uh, are the voice booths you can buy truly soundproof and would uh, an audi audiometric booth work as a soundproof recording booth? Um, the booths that you can buy, they're, it, it's quite broad because there are so many different types um, and I don't want to um, be rude to any of the companies, but there's some work better than others. Some aren't meant to be truly soundproof. Um, some are there to dampen sound. So you can get something called vocal booths to go they are not meant to be truly perfectly soundproof they are fabric um they are acoustic curtains um and they are going to stop reflections but they're not going to stop your neighbor's sound coming through so that's not a truly soundproofed booth but it will help with reflections then you've got people like studio bricks who create really good high quality actually fully soundproof booths um and the um what was it about the audio audio metric Audiometric booths work as a soundproof recording booth. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that, they, they serve the same purpose. It's the same with like, do you get those meeting room pods and things like that, that people have in breakouts in offices, like those work as well, because all they're doing is, is keeping the outside world out and just keeping the inside world quiet in there as well. So those absolutely work too. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, another question is, I record in a closet which has acoustic foam on the doors, acoustic panels on reflection points on the walls of the room and a draft excluder around the door frame. This has improved the sound of the room. The question I'm asking is, there is anything else I can do to improve the sound? <laughs> okay, cool. Um, it'd be hard without hearing it. So whoever you are, if you're listening, send me a sample and i'll have a listen um with small spaces really small spaces like a wardrobe or in a cupboard sometimes it's not enough to just do the reflection points but because reflection goes so quickly in small spaces you might just need to treat the whole thing um it's it's like being in a in a toilet you know the the, the reflections happen so quickly that just picking the points isn't going to be enough so maybe that will help um and also if your ceiling's really high it might be worth bringing it down somehow um, because that can all, always create um, a problem. But if you're listening, send me a sample. I'll be happy to, to have a listen, of course. Uh, okay, another question. How do I acoustically treat my home studio to get broadcast quality audio? Um, the best thing you can do if you want broadcast quality audio is invest in really good acoustic treatment. I use a few people. I use GIK Acoustics. Uh, they do really, really good panels. Um, I also have passed in the past used Universal Acoustics. They do really, really good foam. 
Um, and it's just about knowing your room. Some need base traps, some don't need base traps, some need more protection, some need less protection. Um, I would suggest if you really want it broadcast quality that you speak to and, you know, you can speak with people who design acoustic treatment and you can ask them to do a test on your room where you send them a recording and they tell you what you need. So if you're looking for a really high quality thing, I would suggest doing that. But the main thing is to just use good quality stuff. Don't buy stuff of Amazon. Um, go with the the people who you know are creating it for big studios. Okay. Uh, and how do you manage outside no noise and disturbing family and neighbors? <laughs> uh, that's been a massive problem in COVID, of course, because everyone's working from home, um, which has been fun. Um, there when it comes to neighbors and noises and, and family members and stuff i mean there's not much you can do unless you have a booth um i could you know you can go and ask them to be quiet but um i think from the last year that i've had people pick their times wisely to record i have a lot of people who record late at night when everyone's gone to bed that's worked really well choosing the quietest point in the house find the place in the house that is furthest away from traffic and gardens and all of that which can be really, really, really helpful. And just buying your family some treats and asking them to keep quiet when you're recording, maybe. Um, but unfortunately, that's part of the issue of voiceover, which is why so many people record at night at the minute, because it's the quietest time. Um, so, you know, you can only do so much. Yeah. Uh, okay. How would you uh, recommend mitigating the noise of electric items like lights, a laptop in a home studio? Are battery operated lights better for this sort of environment? Yeah, absolutely. So that, that comes back to one of my questions about ambient noise. Uh, lights and buzzes and hums are ambient noise. So first things first is you can treat it in post-production. So if you have ambient noise in your recording, what you need to do if you can't get it out of the room is isolate that noise. So record a sample of just that, um, whatever your ambient noise is. Say you have an air conditioner that you can't turn off you're going to record a sample of that air conditioner before you do your voiceover. And then you're going to run some noise reduction on it. So something like RX-8 has really, really powerful noise reduction tools. So what you do is you capture that noise print and then you run a noise pr reduction process and it pulls out those ambient noises. Um, but obviously you want to make sure that you have as little of those as possible. Um, battery operated lights are really, really good. Macs over PCs, I'm afraid people, sorry if you're a PC person, but PCs have louder fans than Macs do. So I always have had Macs in the studio or I run wires out of the booth to make sure that your laptop is completely separate. And then an iPad is also really helpful. So just, um, yeah, just trying to manage that. And just, if you can't get rid of a noise, noise reduction is your best friend and it will, RX will remove it um, as long as you do it correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay uh okay now there is quite a lot of uh questions about microphones mm -hmm. um so i'm about to set up a home studio and have been advised to get either a blue yeti or a samsung as a good startup mic i would suggest this is the blue yeti um i think as far as usb mics go that's probably the best one in the, on the market it's sensitive it's well controlled it's well rounded and it's used by a lot of people um, so I would say the Blue Yeti over it, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what microphone best for a home studio setup with basic acoustic treatment, installed condenser or dynamic microphone? Um, usually we always go condenser over dynamic. Dynamic just isn't sensitive enough. Um, if you're worried about your echo in your room maybe a dynamic or a shotgun mic is going to be better suited because condensers pick up more sound but i'm always i'm a condenser guy i so i would always recommend getting yourself a, a, a nice condenser mic like i say the road nt1 um if you want to do dynamic you can get kind of the roadcaster podcasting mics they're they're pretty good um and if you want to go shotgun i know road do a few small shotgun mics as well um but it's it, it comes down to personal opinion really um a lot of people like shotgun mics which are kind of super focused mics because it takes on less echo but you lose a little bit of the roundness that you get with a condenser so a lot of it's personal taste but i would tend to stick towards condenser mics okay 
Uh, another question, I currently have a home studio set up with a Rode NT USB, which allows me to travel easily. I would love to hear your thoughts on USB microphones versus mic plus interface, as, as well as your tips on room setup and must haves. Cool. So we definitely covered the, the whole battle between USB and audio interface. Um, the Rode NT USB is a great mic. You can also get the Rode NT USB mini, which is even smaller, but just as powerful. So people who are looking for a remote setup, the Rode NT USB and the mini are both really good options. Um, the main thing, the main difference with USB and audio interfaces is you can control your sound more with an audio interface. You can control your gain. You can um, just have more control over the sound rather than if it's straight into USB, you can only do so, so much of it. Um, and what was the other part of the question? Was it must haves? Yes, must haves. Yeah. Uh, must haves for me would be plugins, um, but I think we're going to come to that question later. So I will, I will leave that. But good editing software is a must have mm -hmm. if you really want to take it seriously um, because they make your life easier. You know, don't struggle. It can be so easy if you if you use the right gear, um, and like yeah, and then just anything you can to treat the sound. Uh, what kind of editing software would you recommend? I personally use Pro Tools and Adobe Audition. Um, they are not for everyone, um, but they are amazing. Adobe Audition is a phenomenal piece of of, of software. Um, it's super powerful. You can do so much of it. Same with Pro Tools, but Pro Tools is a little bit more complicated. It's more the interface is more for musicians. So if you're looking for just voiceover, then I would say Adobe Audition is, is probably the best. Um, but things like Audacity, which are completely free, you know, people do people have been doing voiceover on that for 20 years and they've they've been fine. Um, so just getting to know it is great. And then buying external plugins to help treat the issues you're having, like RX and plate things like that. Okay, uh, what are some common things to know about setting good levels for recording? Great question. Um, really important question as well. People do not put enough weight on the importance of getting the input right. Um, you know, part, half of the job is getting the recording levels right. Too hot or too cold and it's going to be a lot of work for you. So. Um, by too hot, hot and too cold, I mean, too cold is it's recorded way too quietly, too hot is you're right at the top and you're going to peak and ruin the audio. I tend to record with a peak level. So that's my loudest point at around minus nine decibels. And I'm looking for the meat of the audio to be around minus 15 to minus 12. I want to allow lots of headroom. That headroom will then, if someone gets really loud for a moment, we're not going to peak, but also it gives me room to edit. So that's the sweet spot, really. Always get that right before you start recording and it will make your life so much easier. Uh, okay, what was the most effective way of setting gain on a channel? Way of set effect changing the gain on a channel? Um, it will be on your audio interface. So don't ever control the volume in your door. Do it on your interface. So most people are running the Scarlet Solo third gen little interface and you'll have a gain control on there. And if you'll feel that your gain isn't high enough, you need to turn it on there and not on your, not on your computer software. Um, that should be all you need to do. You shouldn't touch the volume or gain on your computer. Mm -hmm. And there is another question about uh, levels. Uh, so I struggle to set up uh, a level for both standard projection and close mic. Mm. Set a level, but find that I often clip when recording. Yeah, and that's an that's a really common problem as well, isn't it? Because you can get louder and quieter and you need to control that. I think a lot of it is mic placement. Utilize where you are on the microphone when you're getting louder. So as you get louder, pull back and when you get quieter, go in. Um, but I think that the without having a compressor on your in chain to 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 level out all the audio, which is an expensive tool to have. Um you can either ride the gain, which means as you're recording, you're controlling the gain to combat those issues, which a lot of producers do, or you treat it by using your spatial awareness of the microphone. Um, but how I combat it is I have a compressor on my channel. So the microphone goes into a compressor, well, goes into my preamp, then it goes into a compressor. And basically what that does is makes all the loud bits quieter and the quiet bits louder and just evens everything out all you're aiming for is a sausage 
as long as your audio looks a bit like a sausage you're doing the right thing okay um uh, another important question are there any plugins and uh, that you would recommend if yeah. so, what might they be i love plugins i spend way too much money on plugins and i work in a recording studio where all everyone talks about is plugins so i end up spending even more money um there are some absolute must-haves for voiceover and that is one that i've already talked about rx8 audio restoration toolkit is the biggest must have in your arsenal because it deals with mouth noises it deals with breaths it deals with plosives it deals with every single thing that comes up in voiceover and it has the all magic noise reduction tool so you can wipe out all of that sound that is the absolute first one that you should be purchasing they always have deals on as well so have a look I think it's usually about 130 pounds for the basic one, but I always see it on sale for like $30 all mm -hmm. of a sudden. Um, so keep an eye out for that. That is the first one. Absolutely. It's called RX8 and it's by a company called Isotope. I said O-T-O-P-E. Um, phenomenal piece of kit. The next one I love the most is something called Soothe 2. Um, it's a plugin I recently started using a, a um, colleague of mine mentioned it to me and it's basically just a giant dial of amazingness um, basically in our voice we have different frequencies some are nice some are not you've got the horrible harsh se sounds and you've got the t -t -t sounds sorry for everyone's ears there and what this dial does is soften all of those harsh dynamics all those harsh frequencies and it's it's, it's kind of like a multi-band dynamics processing tool which is a really nerdy sentence um and it just smoothens everything out and just makes it really nice and even so that has that is on every single thing i ever do now it's my best friend and it helps me do less eqing really it eqs for me and then on to eq uh, the best EQ you can possibly get is the FabFilter Pro Q3. It's expensive, but it's wonderful. So if you're nerding out and want to get some really cool gear, that is amazing. Um, it's the most powerful dynamic EQ I've ever seen in my life. Um, and then the other plugins I use are from Universal Audio. I have a Universal Audio um, audio interface, so I use a lot of their plugins a lot of their compressors and preamps and things like that. But the main ones are your RX, your Soothe, and your Pro-Q3. Okay. And is there a difference when, uh, uh, you know, for obviously you, you have a studio, like a big studio, and for someone who is just, you know, having a, a little home studio. Mm. So just if you can just name like one or two plugins that you really... But RX, absolutely. When I had my home studio, I had RX. There's no reason why you shouldn't have RX. Uh, if you were only going to buy one plugin and you're going to invest in one thing, get RX. It is incredible. Um, it's the, the the cleverest piece of equipment that's been made. God knows how they did it. Magic, I'm not sure, but it is phenomenal. So if you only get one thing, save up and get that. You, it, you won't regret it. And it will make your editing a million times quicker. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so now it's a bit different question. Uh, mm -hmm. so someone said, um, editing was taking me so long and I finally realized that I can get my mouth ready a little better. There mm -hmm. is, uh, that means less editing for me. Uh, sticky noise, nasal, na nasal clicks, Fs, S, Ts. Mm -hmm. Can you address tips uh, for that? I heard apples, exercises, ginger beer, etc. Also setting... Uh, yeah, so this is the first part of the question. Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, setting those things up correctly is really important. Mouth noises are the worst, and I'm so sorry who's ever listening if I've got bad mouth noises. It's coffee's the worst for it, and I love coffee. Um, so first thing, avoid coffee and avoid dairy and avoid all of those lovely, delicious things because they make your mouth very tacky. Um, water, green apples, and all those things. And then also just warming up your voice. People forget often that the voice is a muscle and they don't warm up. Um, but you should be warming up just as if you're going for a run. Um, there are lots of warm ups you can do online that you can find. So doing your correct warm ups, making sure you're eating and drinking the right things before, make sure you have water with you at all times. I've not heard the ginger beer and um, things like that, but it's great if it works. Um, I also use a 
honey and ginger lemon tea is really good for just cleaning up the mouth. Um, and then S's and T's is a slightly different problem. You've got mouth noises as an issue and then and nose nasal noises, which is an issue. But, you know, do the correct exercises that will wake all that up. But T's and S's is a completely different battle. If you're struggling with sibilance really bad, um, which is your s, s sounds and your t, t sounds, then that's something that you need to do in with a coach or something to, to help soften those. It's just where you're placing your tongue in your mouth. So you just need to figure out how to fix that. Okay. Uh, there is a question also about kind of clients' uh, expectations. So mm -hmm. advice on what, if any, uh, post-production clients accept me to do, uh, to be doing to clean up a uh, perfect, uh, an audio track recording in my home studio before they receive it. I would also love to know as how to acoustically treat a space. Oh, well, that's, we already, yeah. So just. Yeah. Um so an audition how what to do yeah so mm -hmm. i think there's two the first thing is to always find out what they're looking for do they want the raw audio do they want it processed um you don't want to go through all the efforts of processing something if it doesn't need to be i actually went through this this morning with someone um about processing so the very minimum thing you should be doing is recording the take at a great level in a good space you should be cleaning up any mistakes and making sure you're not leaving kind of you rustling around at the beginning of the take. It should have one second of silence. It should have the take. It should have one second of silence at the end. And in that take should be no mistakes and horrible noises and issues. You should, that's the minimum, clean it all up. One second of silence at the beginning, one second of silence at the end. I always suggest as well, giving a alternate take. So recording the take and then recording it again in an alternate way, just to make sure you're trying to hit the brief because before you've even auditioned those people have an idea in their mind about what they're looking for so give yourself more of an opportunity to get that right um, by doing an alternate take at the other end if they want you to produce it fully um, it's a little bit more complicated you've got to if you're doing it to broadcast levels and stuff you've got to meet rms levels you've got to meet luff levels you've got to meet peak gain levels and all of this stuff um, usually if you can do that you would know what all of that means. If they, if someone's asking you to produce it to a full broadcast level and you don't have the capabilities, don't say you can, because again, it, you'll fall down that route of hating voiceover and, and we don't want you to hate voiceover. Um, and if you can do it and they're asking you to do it, really, they sh um, that, that, should be part, that should be an added cost, really, because it's another service. Um, you're, you're hired generally to be a voice artist, not an engineer. So I try to convince people to, you know, and I'm trying to educate people into the fact that it's a whole big job in itself. Um, so it should be treated that way. Okay. And uh, so when the client asks you for a raw file, mm -hmm. uh, what exactly what exactly do you send them? Do you still normalize, clean up clicks, plosive, excessive bre breaths? Not breaths, but yes, and everything else. Like I said, you want to clean it up and make sure no mistakes. You've not got any horrible mouth noises. Your plosives aren't there. Like clean it all up so it's enjoyable to listen to, but you don't need to be removing breaths and doing all of that stuff. Normalizing, some people do, some people don't. If you're going to do it, only normalize to minus three. Don't normalize to minus 0.1 because it will just be too loud and all of your imperfections will come out again. So small normalizing to say minus three. Clean up your mistakes and send them off and leave your breaths in. People want it to feel natural and don't put music on the audition. It doesn't, it doesn't help. Um, in fact, it just takes it away from the audition. We're focusing on you. Remember that. Okay. That's, I think it's, it's a quite important uh, note also. Uh, what about in, uh, you know, in voice reels? Mm -hmm. Do you, would you, because you do lots of voice reels. Uh, yeah. What do you think if when people add music to it? Or voice, reel, voice reels are different to auditions. So voice reels absolutely should have the full shebang. The the, the voice reel should be a, a showcase of what you sound like in your best setting, your best self with your nicest outfit on, you know, like that is your big showcase. So they should sound like ads that have just come off the radio or they should sound like video games that you've just ripped. Like Because what we're saying is this is how I could sound in a in your job um an audition is very different that an audition is here is me reading a sample of a script to to show you what i can do 
without the bells and whistles because we need to cast someone. But at the, before that, with the voice reel, we're showing you, this is what I'm capable of. And this is what I sound like doing your piece of work. Um, so treat, they need to be treated very differently. But yeah, voice reels should have the full works, which is why it's important that you get one professionally produced and not home produced because we want it to sound broadcast ready like it's just been pulled off of the radio um okay and if uh, if uh, you know you want to have a voice reel to show your also home studio recording mm -hmm. you know would you still you know like how when you do uh voice reels how and you do a lot of remote i mean like probably now only remote voice reels right Yeah, we do loads of remote ones. We actually, the studio is open for, for demos now. Um, but yeah, we've done loads of remote ones all over the world. Um, you mentioned something about a home studio sample. Yeah, what I would suggest doing, what I always recommend to people with home studios is getting your professional demos done with all the music and all the sh big shebang and the fireworks. And then you also have a separate home demo introduction where you sit in your studio and you say, hi, my name's Nick and I'm a voiceover artist. I'm looking forward to working with you on our next project. Here's me in my studio. Just give them a sample of what you sound like. It doesn't need to be much, just an introduction. That alongside your demos will be put you in a really good place. Okay, lovely. Uh, I can see that we are already uh, running out of time a bit. I do have some questions. Uh, okay. Some more questions. So it's, well, it's a bit more about the industry, I would see. Uh, so someone, uh, Keith said, I'm hearing of jobs receiving hundreds of application. Is the voiceover industry now overcrowded? <laughs> good, good question. Good question. I like that. Um, so yes, there is a lot of people doing voiceover right now, but at the same time, there is so much work. Um, so it's crowded it's busy there's a lot of people doing it but at the same time there's a lot of work to be done you know with everything going online it, it i don't think overcrowded is correct uh, is the right word i think that it's definitely crowded and there are jobs that are getting hundreds of applications absolutely but that's only on the big big platforms you know i think it's important to remember when you're building a voiceover business there's that there's so many avenues you can look at and there's so many ways that you can deal with voiceover and finding voiceover work and by doing all the things that we're discussing and making sure you're sitting above the rest that's how you're going to land those jobs it's the same as in any creative work i mean every audition there is for an acting role there's hundreds of people same for musicians it's it's a great job of course people are wanting to do it um but i wouldn't worry no i think that yes we're it's a crowd it, it's become quite crowded but also the other thing is there are going to be a lot of people that as we go back into the normal world again are going to drop off a of voiceover they're not going to be interested anymore they're going to think ah oh, that wasn't really for me so yes we've had a surge but it will calm back down but the work hopefully will still grow um so i think hold out it it will shift and become more even again mm. and uh Also, it seems that the, the voiceover industry has changed quite a lot recently. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that there are some trends at the moment, you know, also in terms of kind of like, you know, what was ex, uh, accepted for, uh, expected from voiceover artists uh, 10 years ago, five years ago, and now like, uh, you know, there are maybe some new voiceover artists on, uh on the market so what do you think it's yeah there's been loads of change i think the biggest one for me is diversity and inclusion um you know i'm from a really working class background i don't didn't grow up with much money and all of this and you know 15 years ago i would never had an opportunity to do voiceover for a living and now i wake up and do it every day and i think part of that is because voiceover is becoming accessible And I think that's really, really amazing because it's allowing more people to do it. It's becoming more affordable, which is fantastic. And we're celebrating other voices now. You know, you don't have to have that golden BBC voice to be successful. You can be from anywhere, you know, and that is the truly wonderful thing about voiceover now is that it celebrates everyone. And the biggest thing at the moment is real people talking about real things. So you don't need that big voice to be successful in voiceover you need to have something to say and a way of saying it if you can portray real emotions on the mic you, you that is all we need is real honest emotion because that's what people connect with now especially from covid we're all looking for personal connection so if you can create that connection you're shooting absolutely 
Um, and that's, I guess, for me, the biggest change. And also the advancement of technology. You know, 10 years ago, the idea of recording a voiceover at home would have just is just bonkers. And now everyone can do it. Um, and that is amazing. Um, thinking that we can now just all do it together for a third of the price. It's, it's uh, really exciting, I think. Uh, okay, a few more questions. Away from all technical consideration, how do you control your breathing and popping sound when recording your voice? Cool, perfect. So let's talk about popping and plo so popping is plo uh, they're called plosives, um, and we'll talk about. I, I can't go too much into detail because it's quite a long fix. But first off, we want to get one of these pop shields. So I'm going to put the pop shield in front of my mic now, and it just captures some of that air when I say apple. It captures it. But the biggest problem with plosives is the way that we say peas. So when we say pea, we put it at the back of our mouth and we push it forward. And we, when we do that, we release a bunch of air and then the air punches the microphone in the face and it creates this big boom sound. By placing the pea at the front of the lips and controlling how much air comes out when we say those peas, we can soften those pea sounds. So instead of we can get we're just controlling the airflow or we go slightly off center. There's lots of different ways to deal with it. Um, what was the other one other than P, sorry? Uh, control your breathing and popping sounds. Yes, the breathing is, what I always say to people is use grammar. Grammar is a really nice way to control your breathing. Uh, you never want to breathe and talk at the same time when you're under a microscope. So don't exhale through your nose as you finish a sentence, for example. You want to kind of talk, 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 talk. Talk, 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 talk. Just control the breath and think about where you're placing it. Because in editing... We have the magic of just cutting all those breaths out. So just make sure you separate it all. You're not live. You can take your time and just, uh, yeah, think about the sentences you're saying and prepare with a breath. Mm -hmm. uh, some quick uh, question uh, is just what is uh, an RMS level? Uh, good question. I probably rolled over that far too quickly. Um, so we're getting into the nerdy conversation of loudness Um now rms i can't remember what, real i can't remember what it stands for i'm really sorry but it basically means the loudness that we can audibly hear perceptive loudness so we've got peak level which is the the decibel level of the audio but that isn't the loudness that we hear rms and luff levels are perceived loudness so that, that's the volume technically that we feel like we we get to know and that's how we measure volume on streaming platforms, on radio stations. And that's where all the kind of broadcast standards come in. So for example, audio books tend to be recorded at minus 21 RMS, and that's the perceived loudness of the audio. Spotify comes in at minus 14 RMS, and it's just the perceived loudness of how loud we hear it. Um, there's a lot more to it. I'm just need to go over it briefly, but it, yeah, it's basically the perceived loudness. Okay, and also what is an uh, uh, ISDN line? ISDN line is becoming, ob I, I believe it's actually being wiped out of the industry. I think it's becoming obsolete, so I wouldn't worry too much about ISDN. It's a really, really expensive way of dialing into sessions, but we have Source Connect now, we have IPDTL, we have Clean Feed. So ISDN, I was speaking to the guys at the studio, actually, and they were saying they maybe use ISDN once every two years when they're patching into a radio station. Um, it's kind of becoming an obsolete source now. So don't worry so much. Get clued up more on Source Connect and how the, those things work. OK, and uh, last question. All right. Um, how important is promoting yourself? Is having a website or a profile on Mandy that displays your voice reel and credits worthwhile? Oh, so absolutely. Well, think for like this, you know, if you started a business, would you promote it? Of course you would. Um, you are starting a company. When you decide you want to get into voiceover, it's different to acting. You know, you, you, you don't, you can't be as aloof as you are as an actor. You are a business, you are a brand, you are offering a service and you're normally dealing with people who are not in the creative industry. So don't understand how we work. So you need to be presented as a company who offers a service. And that means a good website, fantastic branding that suits you, good marketing strategy, nice demos, good bio, professional breakdown of your services. Because otherwise, we don't know what we're buying at the end of the day. If I'm, if I'm an exec at wherever at HelloFresh and I need a voiceover, 
um, I need to see what I'm buying. It's not enough just having a, an Instagram that says I'm a voiceover artist because I don't understand what that is. But if you say to me, you know, I can provide voiceovers in two days, I offer you two revisions, I can record it in this format, I have a home studio that you can dial into, you're making it easier for me. And then if I also see reviews and testimonials and nice branding and past work, it's just giving me that trust because that's that's all it is, isn't it? It's trust. We need we 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 invest in things that we trust in. Um, so you need to build that trusted brand. That's so key, actually. It's probably the most important thing about voiceover. It's not even, you know, having a good voice is important, but being business smart and knowing how to brand and market your business is going to make you the biggest success. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so that was the last question. So I would just, uh, I think it would be nice if you can, uh you know say again like how people can reach uh, reach mm -hmm. you also i believe that there is some discount for mandy members uh for the uh, voice voice reels yes so absolutely um yes yeah, so i am nick clinch you can catch me at hello at notablevoices.co.uk um i believe yeah all mandy people get 10 percent off if you quote mandy um so you please come come in and have a chat with me um we do free phone consultations and zoom consultations so just come and have a chat or if you just want me to listen to your audio please do or if you just have a question completely unrelated that you want to have a chat just come and have a chat i'm also on instagram at noble voices and twitter and blah 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 um but yeah I'm, I like to chat about audio. I'm a massive nerd. I would love to chat with you about audio. So jump into my inbox and let's talk about RX-8 or FabFilter or Sue or whatever it is you want to talk about. <laughs> okay. Uh, Nick, thank you so much, you know, for spreading all your knowledge. Uh, uh, I think it was, uh, you, you gave so many tips. Uh, I'm sure people will uh, appreciate that very much. Of course, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Lovely. Okay. Thanks very much, guys. Have a lovely evening. Thanks. Bye bye.